Good evening, and welcome to the second EBMS sponsored community forum entitled The Benefits Out of a Collaborative Academic Medical Center for Hampton Roads. I'm Dr. Richard Homan, the Provost, President, and Dean of the School of Medicine at EBMS, and we're so excited to have everyone participate this evening. We expect a lively and informative forum, which can hopefully provide the Hampton Roads community with a better understanding of the potential collaboration of academic institutions in the region to improve the health of our communities we serve and develop potential opportunities for economic development as well. First, I shall introduce some of our speakers and academic leaders from ODU and NSU, and will then provide a very brief slide presentation to provide some context and background information before we engage our speakers in a dialogue moderated by Dr. L.D. Britt, Chair of Department of Surgery at EBMS. Later in the program, we'll take questions from you, our audience, and so please use the Q&A tab on the side of the Blue Jeans function, and also post questions on Facebook if you wish. At this time, it's my honor and privilege to introduce our invited speakers and invited academic leaders who will be participating in the forum this evening. The first two are very special speakers who are internationally renowned titans in academic medicine. They are really mythical, and legendary figures in my, in my profession of medicine. First is Dr. Victor Zhao, who is internationally known for his impact on medicine through his seminal work and research in cardiovascular medicine, genetics, and his leadership in healthcare innovation. He currently serves as the president of the United States National Academy of Medicine and the United States Academy of Sciences. Dr. Zhao has an extraordinarily distinguished career in academic medicine. He has served as the Chancellor for Health Affairs at Duke University and the President and CEO of Duke University Medical Center. And in addition, he has held the positions of Chair of the Department of Medicine at both Harvard and Stanford. Dr. Zhao has written and spoken extensively about the challenges facing academic health centers in the changing healthcare landscape. I'm, I'm also privileged to introduce Dr. Elias Elias Zerhoni, a physician, scientist, and pioneer in medical imaging, and formerly served as director of the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Zerhoni is no stranger to EVMS nor to Hampton Roads. During his early career, he spent four years on the EVMS faculty and vice chair of the Department of Radiology, and then subsequently joined Johns Hopkins. During a six-year term as head of the NIH, Dr. Zerhoni created the, the roadmap pathways for academic health centers to accelerate the development and delivery of new medical treatments and other innovations in healthcare and medicine. And in 2009, he was appointed as one of the nation's first presidential envoys to foster scientific and technological collaboration with other nations. And now I'd like to introduce our two renowned academic leaders in Virginia representing both Norfolk State University and ODU respectively. First, Dr. Devana Bolton is Provost and Vice President for Academic Affairs at Norfolk State University, and as, as such is the university's Chief Academic Officer and is leading the transformation of Norfolk State's academic enterprise into a nationally recognized center of excellence. Prior to joining Norfolk State, Dr. Fulton was the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences and Professor of History, Humanities, and Languages at the University of Houston downtown. During her time at Houston, Dr. Fulton led the college's strategic planning and increased enrollment of graduate undergraduate programs and established a center for Latino studies. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Augustine Ago, who is the provost and vice president for academic affairs at Old Dominion University, and as provost is the institution's chief academic officer. He has responsibilities for undergraduate and graduate educational programs, the faculty, and all accreditations. Prior to joining ODU, Dr. Ago was served as Dean of the School of Health Professions and Rehabilitative Services at Indiana University in Indianapolis. And previously, he served as the founding Dean of the School of Health Professions and Studies at the University of Michigan, Flint. So now I'd like to also uh, introduce our EVMS Titan in academic medicine, Dr. L.D. Britt, who is our moderator in this evening. He's the Brick, Brickhouse Chair of Surgery, the Henry Ford Professor of Surgery, and the Chair of the Department of Surgery at EBMS. Dr. Britt is a pioneer in the field of acute care surgery and is one of the first 
is the first EVMS faculty to be elected as the National Academy of Medicine. He has also been a member of the EVMS faculty for over 35 years and is revered internationally for his surgical leadership and innovation. In the past, he has served as a president of many U.S. surgical societies, including the American College of Surgeons, and has received virtually all academic honors in the United States and nationally, internationally in the field of surgery. In 2017, Dr. Britt was received a $2.5 million NIH grant to study the surgical disparities of the nationwide uh, issues in concert with the American College of Surgeons. So before I turn the program over to Dr. Britt, I'd like to present some slides to be able to provide some context and then we'll be joined by Dr. Britt and our special guests. So the, the, the context of this is there are opportunities for Hampton Roads. Uh, first is the economic status of Hampton Roads to lay the groundwork. Uh, I, I, I'm quoting Dr. James Cook, the former president of ODU, who provides the state of the union essentially of Hampton Roads, the state of the economic status here in the region who described the last decade of 2010 19 to 19 as the lost decade, where we really didn't have much growth in this region. Um, we do have significant dependency on the military budget, which may be at risk. And of course, during the pandemic, there's been enormous impact on tourism, the Port of Virginia volume, increases in unemployment, and a disproportionate impact on minority communities, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic related to increased morbidity, mortality, more food insecurity and unemployment. <laughs> this just demonstrates the relatively low growth of this region and provides an opportunity that we all may have to try to provide an economic driver for the region through a collaborative economic health center model. I also wanna just briefly touch on the status of Hampton Roads. We've made a lot of progress in this region, uh, and yet there are still many areas where we have much work to do, especially in the areas of infant mortality, maternal mortality, cancer, and also a need to address the social determinants of health. Those are the issues related to, to employment, to behavior, to lack of opportunity, to food insecurity that also lead to poor health outcomes. It's not only medicine and the delivery of care that improves the health of the region, and it is other factors as well. And we may discuss that later tonight. I just want to uh, outline a few slides just for context. Here's the infant mortality rate for Norfolk. And I just want to have you focus on the gray line and the red line. The red line is the infant mortality for African-Americans in this region. And, and that's astronomically higher than the national mean. It's two, over two times the national mean and two times for Virginia. We have much work to do to improve the health of those in this community. Breast cancer, the same thing. These are data from, from Suffolk, Virginia, which demonstrates almost a twofold increase in breast cancer mortality among African Americans in Suffolk compared to their counterparts in the rest of Virginia and around the country. This is for prostate cancer from Portsmouth, which demonstrates almost a threefold increase of risk of cancer mortality from prostate cancer in the African American community compared to to the rest of the community in Virginia and nationally. So therefore we have a lot of work to do and through our collaborative work with our academic institutions and clinical partners, I think we have an opportunity to improve the ability to improve the health of the region and create um, opportunities to elevate our academic and clinical reputations. At this time, I'd like to turn it to Dr. Austin Aga, who's the pro provost at ODU, just to give a brief overview of the health sciences at Old Dominion University, Dr. Aga. Well, thank you, Dr. Herman. Uh, so, so at Old Dominion University, we have approximately 3,000 students, um, you know, who are taking classes in one of our 26 degree programs that we offer at ODU. Um, just within the College of Health Sciences alone, we have roughly 2,700 students. And as of date, we have 90 faculty members, and we have added, um, we have secured funding to add eight more faculty by uh, fall of 2021. And that's as a result of our plan to establish a freestanding school, the School of Public Health. And uh, within the College of, of, of um, 
the health sciences, we have five schools. We have nursing, physical therapy, medical diagnostics, and community and environmental health, and dental hygiene. And so in terms of our, of our uh, the investment in education, we have uh, approximately $5 million in sponsored research just uh, within the College of Health Sciences. But as a university, we have um, about um, $70 million uh, that will be, will be tied to, uh, to our research investments. And um, in terms of clinical services, we have um, as a speech, language, the third, the third pro the program, there's also a, a clinic uh, in a physical, a physical therapy, and that's where we provide um, new clinical services to um, those who may not have uh, food insurance. And in addition to that, we have a center for, for telehealth, innovation, education, and research, and a nationally ranked master's uh, degree program uh, uh, in nursing. Our total budget, uh, again, just for the School of uh, the College of Health Sciences, is approximately uh, $20 million. And in terms of ODU's uh, regional impact, um, it's estimated to be uh, uh, $2 million. So overall, as, uh, as, a, as a university, uh, we have made a lot of investments in, um, in health sciences. And um, as we look forward to, to establishing the School of Public Health, there's already plans on our way to get uh, some additional resources. Thank you. Next, Dr. Fulton for Norfolk State. Hello, I uh, really believe that uh, Norfolk State's health sciences enterprise will be a very valuable um, asset to this partnership and in the Hampton Roads area. Our uh, community-based and community-focused education is um, has focused around in health sciences are pre-nursing, nursing and allied health programs. We have over 800 students in these programs, which includes 80 students at the professional phase of nursing, as well as 15 students in our Master of Healthcare Administration program, which is uh, a new program that we're offering uh, beginning this year, but has already garnered uh, a lot of attention for students. Our research enterprise comprises $18 million, and that includes a, a $1 million grant from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Inclusive Excellence Grant. And that grant uh, is, uh, supports our project that uh, we call SECURES. Spartans engaged in collaborative, community-focused, course-based undergraduate research. And these students in uh, this program are students in biology and math uh, to support our uh, uh, greater success for students in these STEM areas that will also contribute then to our health sciences. Um, this impacts all of our biology majors, which is approximately 380 students by way of uh, integrated research in laboratory classes. And uh, we also, in our health sciences area, collaborate with the uh, Elizabeth River Project, and um, which also we're, through this project, we're cleaning up the Elizabeth River through education and restoration projects as one of the most polluted rivers in the Chesapeake Bay area. The Elizabeth was once presumed dead. However, we continue to celebrate dramatic recovery um, and um, we are one of the first environmental groups to use a societal impact model, which we uh, know that positively helps business, schools, and homes make progress and that are recognized around the Elizabeth River project. Our clinical enterprise includes nursing students who provide assessment and health screenings around the Hampton Roads area, including Norfolk Women's Shelters, Transitional Housing, 
partnerships with Centara, uh, the Virginia Department of Health, and Virginia Medical Reserve Corps to administer COVID-19 vac vaccinations, faith-based organizations and homeless shelters, as well as Lakewood Plaza and Kojic high-rise apartments. These clinical evalu uh, affiliations uh, are many throughout the Hampton Roads area for both nursing and allied health students. Our institutional budget includes $200 million and Norfolk State makes a regional impact of $560 million. Um, we anticipate that this partnership with the Joint School of Public Health where we will draw on our faculty expertise in, um, in areas of epidemiology and, um, and societal and behavioral sciences and biostatistics will really make a major impact on the health sciences and health sciences education in Hampton, Hampton Roads. Thank you, Dr. Fulton. I can just give a brief overview of EVMS, where we have our tripartite mission of education, research, and clinical care. Our, our, our focus has always been on the community. We were born from the community. We serve the community. And we have our educational programs aligned with that. Many of our medical students and health professional programs have uh, required community-engaged learning uh, curricular tracks, and this past year, over they served over 100,000 hours of volunteer work in the Hampton Roads. We have also been the healthcare workforce generator for Virginia and this region for Hampton Roads and Eastern Virginia. Almost 25% of all the physicians trained uh, at EVMS that are practicing in Hampton Roads, and probably 75% of all the physician assistants. We have 600 medical students, 850 health professional students, including a master's of public health, program where we worked with ODU over the years, and we're going to be participating with Norfolk State and ODU in the creation of the public health school um, under the, the uh, aegis of Old Dominion University. We also train specialists in 35 specialties, residents and fellows ranging from psychiatry, surgery, um, internal medicine, and many subspecialties. Our research enterprise focuses on women's health, cancer care, and proteomics. And we're the only academic, academic center in the Virginia region that has a, an accredited biorepository. Our clinical enterprise includes 190 employed clinicians. Uh, CHKD and Centera Healthcare are our clinical partners, and they've been extraordinarily supportive of our educational programs for 40 years. Uh, we are ranked in primary care, tied with Yale and VCU. 49 of 188. Our budget's about 262 million and our impact is about a billion four. So this is just a, a brief slide to demonstrate the, um, the funding streams that, that are required for academic health centers. Uh, it comes from some from tuition, from, some from the state, but traditionally it's from hospital partners. And we're thankful for, EV, for Centera Healthcare for the affiliation agreements they provided. Um, uh, over the last few years and have almost quadrupled the number of dollars coming to EVMS uh, for our academic programs. So we, we work together with ODU and many other academic health center hospital, affiliated hospitals in this region, including Riverside, Chesapeake, and the Hampton VA. So the call to action is we need to address the regional economy. We need growth and economic diversification. Uh, we want to retain talent from NSU, ODU, and our EVMS grads, uh, address the health disparity in this region, which also contribute to econ income inequality, and realize the potential of advancing our academic brands in the clinical institutions and academic institutions in this region. So the opportunity is to advance our academic and clinical brands, establish the region as a medical destination, for new research in healthcare delivery science, apply technology to clinical care, enhance our population health management with ODU and NSU, with their uh, public health school, and reduce the need for out-of-state referrals or out-of-region referrals by providing more clinical subspecialties that we can train through EVMS's programs. Um, 
So there are many opportunities that we have before us, and we're looking forward to some of the wisdom and guidance from our special guests and, and are waiting for questions from our, our audience as well. So let me stop there and turn the program back to uh, Dr. Britt. Thank you. I want to talk about models and partnerships. Uh, what's the best academic medical center model do you think we should have at EVMS? I'm going to ask Dr. Zhao and Dr. Zahoni. They have had great experiences at academic medical centers. We're trying to be a best practice too. The, what you heard, the background, uh, can you give me some commentary on that? Sure, thank you, LD. Happy to speak about this. As you heard, I was previously chancellor for health affairs and CEO at Duke University. <clears throat> and uh, in that regard, I oversaw the health system, the hospitals, the ambulatory practice, the medical school, nursing school. So it was an integrated model. But also prior to that, I was at Harvard and in at Brigham Women's Hospital and the teaching hospital at Harvard. And prior to that, I was at Stanford. So there's no one size fits all. If you look okay. at academic medical centers, they're all different models. I think what really is important is to leverage the unique strengths and to create partnership that works for each other. Importantly, I think there has to be shared goal and shared vision and trust and being able to see that it benefits everybody when you come together. So, so for even EVMS and for um, ODU and uh, Norfolk State and Centura and all this, I think the opportunity is clearly there. If I listen carefully to your presentation, there's a unique strength on each one can bring to the table. And I would think that a complete merger is not in the works. It would be a mistake. It will be a partnership, a collaborative partnership, where each one look at their contribution and look at the benefits from that contribution. So for example, if you imagine that the clinical side of the universities and EVMS, et cetera, they have clinical faculty, nursing, et cetera, and the great research come to go Centura, I think that will make a dynamite academic medical center because you've got quaternary care, secondary, tertiary, secondary care, primary care, all the way to community care. As uh, Dr. Fulton talked about, the really good work they're doing in the community, right? And then you need to collaborate with the Department of Health and the community itself to address the whole issue of population health. As already been said, and I won't take too much time, the research is amazing, the opportunity when you bring together this, the experts from different disciplines on the university together with the medical school and the clinical enterprise. So what am I saying? Well, we all know that health care only determines 10% of health. The rest is behavioral, social, genetic, you name it, social determinants. So when you bring together the economic side of a medical, of a university to um, policy, ethics, and others, you can really bring together the best of kind, if you will, to improving the population health. So coming along with that, as been said, would be the opportunity to get a lot more research, world-class reputation, improve the economy. So I won't take any more time except to say the starting point would be every partner has to come with their strength, have a shared vision, and begin to work together, look at relative strength, and create a collaborative model. I think a merger, to my understanding, is probably not the right thing to go. What well, that is out. Thank you so much. That's a very encouraging vision. I'm going to ask Dr. Jahone if he has anything he wants to add. Well, I fully agree with what Dr. Zhao said. Uh, I would say that what is interesting to me uh, is that if you look at the history of academic centers and their models, Typically, the synergy uh, occurred uh, historically between a medical school and the hospital. That's usually where it starts. But it starts because you want to address acute care, tertiary, quaternary issues in the community. However, I think we're seeing a transformation phase right now where because of the cost of health care, because of the disparities of health care, the um, inequalities, 
institutions are getting to become more systematic about how their role is, as Dr. Zhao said, you have to look at the continuum from prevention, primary care, all the way to quaternary care research and translation of that research. So I think the models are evolving. In some ways, I think you're in a proto-model situation because you're completely independent of each other, pretty much. Uh, you, you don't really have, at this point, a model forward. And this is what I always say, don't copy the past. Every institution, every region, every population is different. And I think you have to have a vision for the future. But that vision for the future cannot be developed, if you will, as, as Dr. Zhao, by force. It cannot be just a merger and then let's be happy. You have to develop a, a transforming vision. And I think there's an opportunity here for Hampton Roads because everybody in the country is looking for that transformation. But I would say that from my point of view, you cannot transform health, and we've seen the statistics, uh, without a transformation of the health institutions themselves. And I think the way to think about it is not the traditional academic health center. And because the, the word center came from the fact that you had a major hospital with a major medical school with a lot of very talented clinician scientists and clinical providers. That's the notion of center. Today, we're talking more about academic health systems. And as you know, from the point of view of reimbursement, from insurance, it is more and more important to really look at being accountable for the health of your population in all its dimensions. Because at the end of the day, the cost will fall on you. And I think the idea of relying on, on high-end procedures and forgetting the population health is a dead end because as reform is on, ongoing, as Medicare is changing the way it looks at reimbursements, I think the notion today is that you go from an academic health center to a collaborative to create an academic health system that is accountable. Where it would be accountable to insurance processes, to management of the population risk, I don't know. But I think this is the work of the community, and everybody should be at the table. I'm a little surprised, actually, that Centara is not represented, because to me, Centara is the major uh, actor with a lot of uh, history in quaternary, tertiary, quaternary, and it needs to be uh, brought in this conversation. It cannot be just an academic exercise. That is your honing. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to bring in, because you mentioned cost and accountability, what would you propose or suggest, I'm asking both of you, would be a sustainable funding mechanism for contributions from a state health system and a university? So that's the model. What would be a mechanism? What would be a good sustainable financial mechanism? Dr. Zellman manages a major center. So <laughs> there he is. <laughs> he gives me the tough question. I was going to ask him to do this. Well, you know, as I said, I think we have to begin by talking about shared vision. Okay. You have to agree to have shared vision and common goals. You can't talk about money first. Talk about where you want to be. And as Elias says, I mean, you have such opportunity. Uh, if I can reiterate again, when you look at Centera, it's got major hospitals right there in Hampton Roads, but it's got a regional distribution system. And when you look at the community where you say there's a real need to improve the health status and the economics and the equity issue, which is so, so important, you have the possibility of bringing people together who want the same thing, right? Where we become the magnet drawing patients, but also caring for the community. But more importantly, in my opinion, looking at the health of community. And that's why I think it's so important that you can bring this together. So I think that's got to start important. What's your relative strength? What are you bringing together? What can we do together that we can't do alone? And therefore, what do we need to say, guess the resources needed? And I would do it that way versus a subsidy model. You give me money from one organization to the other. I think it has to be a strategic model that look at what, it would, what would it take to achieve the goals we want to set. Let's say you say, really what we want to do is to increase the health of the population 
and improve economy? What would it take to get those pieces together? What's your strength? I think that's a much better way of looking at it than a subsidy model. You give me so much, you put that much in. I would just talk about Duke. You saw how much money that we put in that slide yep. from the health system to medical school. But every penny is worth it because what we're able to do is do cutting edge research. And in the context of, I think, uh, Hampton Roads, you know, data is king. And you have so much information from the Department of Health, from the community, from mm -hmm. Center Hospital. And you bring data together, the big data, bringing together genomics and all the other things, you can really make sure you take advantage of the population you serve, not only improve the healthcare, but also get grants in there and so on and so forth. So I, I think it's difficult to say there's a formula. It's really more important to see what does it take to get there. Thank you, Dr. Zhao. Dr. Johone, would you like to add anything to that? Because I'm going to switch. Yeah, to I, think, I think what I would, I would really insist on the point that uh, uh, Dr. Zhao just made, and that is that, in fact, a subsidy model uh, d does not work. I mean, I, I was the executive vice dean at Hopkins, and frankly, you have to have a joint uh, view, a common vision to execute on the vision. I think you need uh, both support from the institutions themselves, but the political environment is important. You know, what is what is important to achieve here for the state, for the region? And in addition to that, what I would say is that you can't just copy the, the, the models of the past. You have an opportunity here to leapfrog. And I think, you know, you just heard a couple, a comment of, a couple of comments that I think is, is really a potential a uh, unification factor, an integration factor, and a synergy factor uh, within the institutions of Hampton Roads. And that is the fact that that Santara has become an outstanding organization with great management, success financially, and the ability to me is to use that as a platform to transform healthcare. How? Well, clearly a unified information system Clearly, the ability to do telehealth, teleconsultation, the ability to manage chronic disease out of the hospital, the ability to regenerate economic activities beyond Hampton Roads through this innovation. So I wouldn't disconnect the notion of vision, which is what uh, Dr. Zhao is talking about, a common vision from the idea of leapfrogging, innovation that you can do, you can make, because you're not so bound to uh, uh, relationships that are really sclerosing you in a way. And I think that's the way I see it. I mean, there's two faces to the coin. There's an opportunity here. Can you take it? Do you have enough wisdom and leadership? If you start talking about resources, everybody watches their wallets and their budgets, and they say, well, where's the accountability? Why do you want this money? Who's going to use it? How are you going to use it? No, it has well, to come to a common part. Uh, you know, I agree with Elias. I think one way to look at this will be to say, let's come together and look at what we want to be. And in doing what they're, they're building blocks, those building blocks will take resources to be sure. But once you've got the building blocks, then you can say, how do we actually resource those building blocks? That's a starting point to be able to look at what scale do you want? Then you also say, what will those building blocks bring back to us? Right. And so if you do that kind of analysis, you'll be able to say, if we invest now and you invest different strength, this is the return we're going to get. Let me just give you one example. At Duke some years ago, Alice know this, we thought that clinical research was going to be great. And we actually invested in creating a Duke Center Clinical Research Institute, DCRI. And it brings in $150 million a year and more. And it's not only leveraging the population, in your case, East Hampton, and in your case, the network of hospitals across, but also the ability to get data analysis, how design, and suddenly this becomes the place. And tomorrow's clinical research is going to be about population health. So therefore, if you design it that way, 
you can look at the kind of return. Let me give you another example. Mayo Clinic um, worked with Optum uh, to United Healthcare to create Optum Labs to bring data together, right, from different health systems. So there are lots of opportunity if you bring it together. But I would say, figure out what resource you need to do in your building blocks, and then figure out what the return could be. And then suddenly you are now at the table looking at how to invest together. Alice, you do you all, agree? You, you all are doing a masterful job. So I, we can agree that the, there's vul, the medical school is vulnerable that we don't have sufficient funding uh, from our hospital partners. But let me go to something else if I could. What, let's say I'm the hospital person. What do they benefit from this, this the model that you have proposed? What do they get out of it? Elias, you want to take this? Well, I, I think it's a tremendous benefit. I mean, look, every academic health center that has integrated that equation has done extremely well. I mean, there's no question that there is value to the hospital, there's value to the medical school, and just like what uh, Victor, there's also value in, in creating additional value to both. And I think this is where the, the two parties have to come together. A subsidy model, a blind subsidy, like, you know, I want social peace, I give you so much money, you go do you want, without synergy does not make sense. So the idea is how do you create one plus one equal three? So from the point of view of the hospital, what, what would be cre critical for that? Research is a very important, especially clinical research and translational research that can bring in uh, uh, additional revenues that are extremely profitable. I mean, if you had a, the ability to do phase one, phase two, phase three trials and establish a clinical research capability, all of that is done in the hospital. All of that really accrues to the hospital. I mean, at Hopkins, our revenues were about 10, 15% of our revenues came from our clinical trials, which were run in the hospital, um, uh, uh, built by the hospital, but organized by the School of Medicine. The same thing is true when it comes to uh, the ability to the, of the hospital to create itself a system, because today, as a single hospital, you can't survive. You have to have a system. Well, to have a system, you have to have people. To have here, you have to have talent. You have to have skills. And those skills cannot be done by the hospital itself. So I know at Hopkins, the hospital would ask us, for example, and the School of Public Health too, by the way, to, to develop new models. So we did develop, for example, what we call the, the uh, Johns Hopkins community practice. And we had a model where we took care, for example, just to show you a specific example of the very, very high cost of diabetic patients in the Baltimore region. And with the School of Public Health and the School of Medicine, we uh, uh, developed grants, that, first of all, and then we studied how to, how to make that, redu how to reduce that how to prevent the hospital uh, from, uh, from having extraordinary costs uh, uh, for these patients, because 20% of the patients in diabetes actually account for 80% of the cost. Yeah. So what we did was to develop a strategy, which was then deployed around the community, where we ensured, actually, we, we, we went at risk for ensuring that the, 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 the patients that were the highest risk, and you know what? The hospital was very happy because it turned out that it reduced its losses. So the question for a hospital administrator is, how do you increase my revenue? How do you reduce my losses? And how do you protect me as an entity from the competition and from the, you know, the, the issues of accountability as an institution to the community? So those are some ideas that I would just share. And LD, may I expand on sure. what Eric just said? Yes. Yeah. So, um, you know, EVMS does work on, they call it delivery signs. I call it implementation signs. Now, if you bring that to the hospitals, it will just make their care delivery even more efficient, right? Yes. And if you look at, uh, um, as I said, data. I mean, you know, the data, there's so much data these days that using the data to generate and make, generate evidence, and change the way we do things, system engineering is really important. And then, of course, the issue of centers of excellence. I mean, every medical center have about these areas of distinction, what they're trend, what they're gonna make, how they're gonna attract the heart patients, and having the academic side of things will greatly 
expand the reputation, uh, et cetera, and cutting edge. So there's a lot of these opportunities. And then, as I said, for the ODU and NSU, uh, NSU, there's tremendous opportunity to bring their academic faculty, to bring their expertise towards looking at how to improve health of population. I wrote a paper in Lancet to say, population health is really convergence. It's not one single science. It's many different sciences coming together. <clears throat> well, well, well put. If I can, yeah, if I can add yeah. some, some things yes, too. Yes. As you asked the question about what does a hospital administrator think about, right? And I was in charge of uh, the clinical practice at Hopkins for a while, and, and so I dealt with that. There is one thing that is important, and that is the referral sources to the hospital. And often those referral sources are not just the academic faculty. They are the private faculty, the private clinic, I mean, the private practices out there. And if you ever uh, um, come up with ideas or concepts that collide with that, the hospital administrator is just not going to play because it's too much of a risk for them. So in your case, it's not different from some academic health centers where there is the hybrid of a faculty. Remember at Hopkins, all the medical school faculty is full-time faculty to the system, not part-time. But we have a, a large community of part-time adjunct uh, 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 folks who want to participate. So you have to make room, that's number one, in the training, for example, what do you provide to them that is of value to them? Residents, uh, graduate students, whatever. The other thing that is uh, very important to consider is specialize the medical school in areas where the private sector cannot, ta cannot tackle. Be complementary to what the hospital needs, to what the hospital wants. So those are fine points that uh, I, I've been, you know, privy to, I'm sure Victor knows, that you need to manage. And if you come in and say, I want a subsidy so I can compete with your providers, uh, that's not going to go anywhere. However, if you say, I want really a collaboration to create, for example, a population health strategy with community uh, implantation, especially in the areas of disparities, then you become sort of the, the angel of the equation, right? because you're, you're solving a, a very important problem, you're creating economic opportunities. And so that's the whole uh, question. It's basically what, what Victor said at the beginning. If you're not aligned, nothing will change. If you get alignment, I think it will, but you have to understand that everybody has their own uh, vested interests. And the hospital administrator often does not have an agenda of his own. He really depends on the agenda of the providers, of the, of the nurses, of the uh, academic institution, the, the, the state, and so on. So I don't want to complicate things, but I think you need to identify those drivers of synergy and avoid the drivers of dissynergy. Dr. Honey, Honey I want to thank you. And Dr. Zhao, man, let's bring in our university partners. Speaking of alignment, I'm going to, I'm going to assume that my university partners uh, Provost Igo and obviously uh, Provost Fulton, that you agree that there's benefit by having this partnership with the medical center. Now, tell me, based based on that, should the governance will the governance change? Will the oversight change? You know, you have an engineering school, you have a business school. What would be the oversight difference if you're part of the model, which we have all agreed it should be three components? So my question is, what will be the oversight, inherent oversight administrative difference, if any? Yeah, so at this point, I don't think I know enough to uh, respond to that question, but I, I do would like to just go back to Dr. Zhao and Dr. Zanoni for the uh, excellent feedback and remarks that you made you know, regarding focus. Um, I like the idea of what we are already moving, looking at that we need to look at you know, public health and population health. And you also reference the telehealth, which also is supposed to be a very strong the component of the type of services that we, that we provide. There was something also that, that you mentioned that's actually very key, that it's not just medicine. We also have to look at the other allied health the profession. Okay. There's business, there's uh, physical therapy, uh, nursing, all of us together are supposed to be part of the, uh, the academic, 
the health sciences. So that, that really um, ties in with what we're already thinking as an institution. Thank you. Dr. Fulton, you, you're Dr. muted. And third word. There you go. Muted? Yep. No, you're fine. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, we've had conversations about um, governance with regard to the Joint School of Public Health. Uh, and there um, are there's a, an accrediting body that um, certainly we have to meet those accrediting standards. Um, but the, I think what is most important is that we're committed to collaboration. And so, and we are working weekly, frankly, uh, have a team working weekly on uh, reviewing and, and developing a governance structure that will uh, work with our three institutions, um, but uh, will also meet the accrediting body um, and, and will meet the needs of the school that we are developing. Um, you know, I, I want to speak to something that Dr. Zhao said about, um, uh, about the, the need for that, that health changes and health is impacted um, by issues or, or areas outside of uh, the health centers. Um, we know that from uh, health promotion communications and health, um, health issues on, um, uh, on uh, health promotion, that people are inspired to change their health behaviors by people who they trust and admire. Um, so we also know that it's important that health communications understand how to frame ideas and recommendations in a way that resonates with their audiences. Um, the uh, Center for Excellence in Health Disparities at Norfolk State really is devoted to this kind of work and engaging communities uh, through our local church leaders and other community uh, partners where we can actually make a greater impact on improving the health of our communities. And so this, this uh, collaboration and partnership, I think, is uh, exactly uh, what, how we're going to be successful in improving the health in uh, Hampton Roads area. But the, the focus and uh, a, um, a real conscious effort about the ways in which we engage our communities uh, with experts from the community is exactly what is needed and what Norfolk State is uh, exa excited to bring to this partnership. Uh, Provost uh, Fulton and Provost Argo. Uh, so, so can I just add this real quick to the, what the, the Dr. Fulton just mentioned, which is very key because when you talk about working with, with the community, we have to be very mindful that we're not going to the community to tell them what they need or what they want, but rather to, to listen to where they think we can make a difference. So to me, I think the approach we're taking right now with EVMS and Norfolk State is really trying to be engaged with the community to make sure that what we are providing are in line with what they see to be in their best interest. Yeah, all of you have been very astute, but at the end of the day, you know, they're gonna ask you what, what are the outcomes? What are the metrics you're gonna to use to show that your model is the correct model? So I'll, I'll throw this out to everybody. What would be the metrics, including Dr. Holman, what would be the metrics that you use or should use to say that this model, this best practice for academic medical center is what is working? Well, if I may, I think the metrics of, of what we call KPIs, key performance indicators, are really not that complicated. I mean, number one, you have indicators of the health of the community. We have several indicators, several registries, and you can actually track it. So that's number one. Number two, you have the ability to, to perhaps, and I think you do, uh, increase the amount of research funding that you can attract. I, um, I am absolutely certain that if you combine public health and medical school in, in an area where there are very uh, important issues here, of disparities and so on, that you can actually include new research 
especially using digital health, using different models of of of, of uh, di distributing care, and proving that. So if I see increases in research funding that says, oh, you have an active community that is trying to innovate, that would be a measure. Obviously, the the third uh, measure is uh, clearly going to be the human capital. At the end of the day, I want to know if you're you're basically working on the same human capital. You're not creating new uh, human capital to address these issues. Fourth is I would uh, uh, measure what you just described, and Dr. Ago was saying, you don't do things to the community. The community asks you to do things for itself, for the community. So having a health council, having the ability to demonstrate through surveys, through measures, that you're listening and you're acting, uh, that is important because you're not going to get the perfect governance day one. You, you walk before you run. But the thing I would recommend is if you want these measures, you have to agree on what I call specific signal initiatives, signature initiatives, right? Something that is clearly defining what uh, Dr. Dr. Zhao was calling centers of excellence. I call them initiatives of excellence, all right? What is it that you're going to stand for and achieve and measure and, and succeed? That is of value to the, to the community and to the institutions of the community. Dr. Zahone, thank you. Dr. Zhao, you mentioned at uh, the outset data. What, what would you say would be some of the metrics that we should use to say that we have the right best practice as far as the academic medical center? Well, I think the alignment of the components for okay. synergy and amplify the performance of each is critically important. As Elliot said, those performance can be measured in different ways whether it's improving population health, increasing economy of the region, whether it's improving the bottom line of the health system and creating more new programs, attracting students and, uh, you know, outstanding faculty to the area, all those are measurable. Okay. I think what people need to sit down to say, what do we want to measure? But let me just be sure that, so I'm not seem to be skirting the issue, but to get to the elephant, right? So, so in my mind, um, I think that it is clear that the any organization, academic health system or center, is the clinical enterprise, and so we one would look towards them to provide more support. But the return can be measured in so many different ways, particularly when you want to say, "I am a." anchor institution in my community. I would say, how do you measure that? Well, at Duke, I mean, every organization has called community benefits. How much are you spending in community? IRS wants you to show that, your know, non-tax structure, right? But that's not sufficient. You know, we would say, how many jobs do you create in the community? And if you were to do any service, are you actually using business in the community and business that is very careful about, about equity and diversity. First, that's what we did at Duke. A supply chain, you name it, give back to those things. Because after all, you are there for the community. And let's not forget philanthropy. I would say strongly on this issue for all of you guys. Because if people truly believe, and I think this is great opportunity for East Hampton Road. And if you look at in Virginia, you're probably behind in many different ways. This is a chance to build a community. And I think that private sector has to step up to it as well. And believe me, when you have a vision and you can lift all tides, you know, people will step up. But that I think is everybody's role. So I would say health system, private sector, new ways of getting revenues in, like creating these kind of partnerships, like I talk about Mayo, Duke, et cetera. And really, there's so many different ways to measure it. I think the opportunity is enormous. Well, thank you. Now, what I would like to do for people on the, in the audience to go to the Q&A, uh, uh, go to Facebook, and submit your questions. What I'll ask, this is a dark question, and I'm going to ask it. What would be the losses to the community if the medical school continues to be undercapitalized? 
I know it's a tough question, but but what would be the losses? Uh, um... Well, I think you're seeing the losses already. Your presentation <laughs> at the beginning was describing what okay. the trends were, uh, not uh, having uh, not to be together. I think it's it's really uh, unique in my view of having so many of the right institutions in the region that haven't come together, and the loss. I mean, you know, when you talked about measures, all right. I think you need you have two kinds of measures. You have the intermediate measures and the out outcome measures. The intermediate measures are jobs, programs, money inflows, the economic, um, uh, you know, biotech park, for example, or biotech companies. Things you can measure as intermediate measures that are tangible. And then you have what I call the outcome measures, where in fact all parties benefit because the region becomes an example, right? Right now, you're, the loss is that you have not taken advantage of, of your opportunities and you're not taking care of your challenges. You're sort of looking in different directions. And that's, a, that's unfortunate. That's unfortunate because the potential is there. You have a great medical school. You have the ability, to, the willingness to do that. If you undernourish all of your partner and then one of them is overnourished, then the whole population loses. Yeah, and that's really the the equilibrium we have to reach. I don't know, Victor, if you agree with that. Well, I would just simply say you have to go back to say why was EVMS founded, right? It's a community medical school. Imagine if it's not there, what do we look like today? I'll bet you everybody say, oh my God, you know, it's so important in this issue, right? Just like the universities, and I think that uh, you know, just the whole idea of not able to sustain the medical education, the sustain the research and the community work it does, you can imagine the loss is substantial. So I do think I agree with you. The implied question is people have to step up to support something that's valuable to the community. It takes money. It's like, you know, talking about, you know, tax. You know, if you don't believe in the greater common good, then, of course, we will be a terrible situation. I think the medical school has, and I would say that same for uh, the Norfolk State University. I think the state sees how important it is. It certainly provides good support. And for ODU, that, you know, these are jams in the, uh, in the region. And you can imagine closing down programs, letting people, it will be just back to the dark ages. Well, this has been a wonderful exchange. People can still submit questions to the uh, Q&A panel. Dr. Johoni, do you, anything you want to say? We're going to have no, some just, close. Just one, 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 thing, um, one thing that is important is the creation of a public health, a school of public health. I really think that's an element of the puzzle that is very necessary for the future. Uh, it's really different. Uh, the, the way public health schools do research, uh, that are embedded in the community, uh, digital health, for example, all of that is important. So that's one element that is missing. The second is don't try to boil the ocean, is my advice. Show exactly what specific initiatives will have a return on investment. Don't ask for an investment without accountability to that investment. And, and that's usually what the, the hospital administrators uh, tend to say. So, well, okay, fine. Uh, you know, I, I have a lot of demands, but if we do this, what will it bring? So if you could identify two, three signal to signature initiative, creating a clinical trial infrastructure, that will need a certain amount of funding initially and that will have a certain return, I think people will listen to that. If you say digital health, community digital health, to manage chronic diseases so they don't end up in the emergency room, the hospital will listen to that. So find Thank you. themes that are tangible, that really are pragmatically uh, um, measurable, if you will, in terms of return on investment, both tangible and intangible. You know, Elias hit it right on the spot. You know, a public health school is actually the common denominator of all these, uh, the three people who's here. And, you know, there's a partnership that you can build. But I would say, Elias, that not the traditional public health. Because we know, as I said, now population health is really the key. So mm -hmm. you can need to go beyond the usual 
surveillance prevention to what about transportation, what about climate, what about all the environmental issues, and bring in these local sectors who make decisions so that when you begin to design roads, design uh, housing, jobs, poverty, education, they're all social determinants. And I think that will be a dynamite school, which will be a great model that not traditional public health schools can emulate or compete with. Thank you, Dr. Zada. That's an excellent co uh, commentary. Dr. Holman, this is from Catherine. Catherine is asking, is curious as to why Centura and Children's Hospital King's daughter are not part of this panel. Well, we could, but then Centera was involved in the last one that we had on health disparities. I think what we wanted to do today was create an aspirational model to bring the academic institutions together. Because I, 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 as you can see, I think there's an enormous synergy with all the different assets in nursing and social health, social, uh, uh, social work and um, physical therapy, the other health sciences that EBMS does not have. And we need to weave these together. We have the components for more of a traditional academic health center model. It's just that they're disparate. And what we're trying to do is to thread the needle to pull together as a community together, academic community. And then from that, we can set the foundation to get the clinical enterprises engaged as we work toward improving the health of the region. Excellent. Speaking of regions, the last question, because I know we've passed time. Greg, can, I, can I disagree, uh, if I may? Uh, I, think, I think it's really a combination. I've never seen uh, an academic health system evolve from the academic point of view without positive involvement from the health system, because at the end of the day, we're talking about health. And so I would involve Centara at all levels, if I were you. Uh, I think, you know, you don't want to just come up with something that then gets a, a surprise to them uh, uh, as non-participants non in that component of things. They have to buy in. They have to see that this is a an a, a, a honest uh, um, uh, attempt at really lifting the entire region, not just from one pillar, uh, the academic pillar, but from all pillars. So I, I would just say it's, to me, it's really, they need to be at the table. You know. I, I agree with that. And we also have other clinical partners, CHKD, is, as you know, you're, you know, you're, um, that's the only freestanding children's hospital in the region. And we have other clinical partners as well. So. You know, we, we'd love to have a community here um, on a screen to be able to address all of these issues, but we have to start at, at, at the elemental components of it. And that's what we're doing now. And we're trying to create these fora to be able to then create the stage so we can have the conversation and pull everybody together because it is absolutely essential that the, the three academic institutions work together with all the clinical institutions to create this common vision. Now, let me go to my, my university colleagues. Uh, Dr. Fulton and Dr. Agro, if you had a center of excellence that you would use and emphasize based on your partnership with the Academic Medical Center, what would be that center of excellence? Something that Dr. Zhao mentioned. What, what, what would be your concentration? What would be your emphasis? So for Norfolk State, um, we realize that public health schools and programs are charged with providing professional development and training for the public health workforce. Uh, whether professionals seek to build new competencies or enhance existing ones. And NSU could be a model of excellence for workforce development or continuing education. As an HBCU, NSU provides academic training opportunities tailored to a wide variety of students. Uh, we're well positioned to build on this expertise with our uh, faculty uh, focus on, uh, or program focus on continuing education, micro credentials and more, and forming community-based training partnerships with the Mid-Atlantic Public Health Training Center funded by Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, you asked the question earlier about metrics, like how do you um, demonstrate that uh, uh, this, this uh, work is actually making a difference when looking exactly at uh, the increased diversity of uh, healthcare uh, workers, uh, uh, individuals involved in um, the healthcare uh, profession. And as uh, a um, 
historically black university, NSU is really poised to contribute to that. And that's one particular method. Um, one of the things that I think you know, we don't want to dance around is, and, and this past year has certainly demonstrated for us how um, much uh, race, racial discrimination, inequalities are really a public health crisis, right? And um, NSU is coming to this uh, collaboration with this particular premise uh, because we understand how uh, the, the, whether it is uh, the pandemic or um, the environment and um, other kinds of public health crises, but the ways in which a history of racial discrimination makes that uh, even more impactful in African-American communities and other communities of color. And, and so it is, this is both the expertise, but also a real commitment to social justice that we are bringing to this partnership. Uh, Dr. Argo? Yeah, one is Dr. 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 Zalu, you want to now go to Dr. Argo? No, 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 uh, Dr. Argo, Dr. Argo, please. Yes, yeah, yeah. well, thank you. We just want to agree again with uh, Dr. Fortin. Um, we also as a university believe that one of the ways that we can contribute uh, to addressing um, you know, health disparities in our region is to make sure that we also produce um, healthcare providers who look like the community. So we, we have really focused on making sure that we have um, the diversity in our health science uh, programs. But I do want to go back to the, question, uh, the comment you made uh, a few minutes ago, Dr. Zhao. Um, Talk about big data science. It is very you know, critical for us as a community. We collect a lot of data in Norfolk, but how do we use the data? When it comes to research, that's one area that I think um, EVMS, ODU, and um, Norfolk State can work together to begin to um, find ways to use data to inform some of the decisions that we make here. Um, just a few months ago, um, we established the a digital neighborhood um, to mitigate health disparities. And that's, again, a cooperation um, AVMS, ODU, and the first because we really have to use data to inform how we make decisions. We can do everything. So it's not just about money. Obviously, we all would like to have more money. Uh, but in the absence of some well-defined metrics and how to use data to make decisions, there will never be enough money uh, to do uh, the things that we want done. Dr. Zhao? Uh, I was saying earlier about building blocks. So th there's two ways to look at this issue. One is to come together and say, we have a big, bold vision and create an academic health system, which will be, well, I won't say that easy, right? Because you already talked about funds flow, governance, you name it. The other way is to say, let's do a few building blocks together. So let's take Elliot's idea of public health. The School of Public Health can be state funded, yeah, but bringing together the three academic institutions, plus some expertise in Centura, and there you go, you got something that's new, that's co-governed. That's easier, right? And you can imagine, think about, as said earlier, talk about clinical research, clinical trials. That's where, you know, Centera comes together with this academic side, the school, and build that. And that is also manageable. You can look at how to fund it. So one idea would be to do this big bang. The other way is to start it dancing and creating blocks of things that can work, that can be governed fairly clearly, and the resource funding. And then once you learn that, then you may be able to get to the next stage of an even greater vision. Good. That's what I would say could be one way to approach this. Uh, that, that is exactly, you know, the, the idea of signature initiatives to walk before you run. But to go back to the, the question of the, um, the uh, audience about what center of excellence, what is it that we can focus on? I mean, training and all this, of course we do that. But I think you touched on something very important, and that is not just data sciences. I wouldn't call it data sciences. It's really the transformation of health by digital health. How do we do that? 
how do we do this in all the communities? I don't think you want to be cornered into just the minority community, which suffers from more than just health factors, but also poverty and education and so on, that are extra health factors, that are social determinants. So I think if you if you really design the, the school and the, and the building block against around this vision that everybody has, but nobody knows how to do, of embedding digital health, telehealth, data science, management of population rather than management of every individual, one one encounter at a time, prevention of urgent and, and emergency care, uh, abuse. Uh, I think those things are really valid. They're really um, circumscribed and they can truly, they require the centers, the center of excellence. I'm not aware of centers of excellence that are focusing on so much on this idea of reducing health disparities uh, across the entire population. Any comments from my university partners about uh, centers of excellence? What, what, what resonates with me is the foundational uh, bricks that Dr. Zhao mentioned. I like saying that we have to create a pyramid, but you have to lay a foundation. And, and you can't put the cap of the pyramid on first. You can't be aspirational at the very at the very top. You have to create opportunities. And I think that's what tonight's um, session is, is to, is to create opportunities for us to understand where the assets are and then get our arms around that, which is meaningful and can create value for this region together as academic institutions as we bring in the clinical enterprises that we need. That's, this, is, this is necessary, but not sufficient. Uh, but it starts the dialogue and life's about relationships. And, and this creates better relationships among the academic institutions. And we need to do the same um, in the model to bring our clinical partners in as well. So um, uh, I appreciate Dr. Zhao's metaphor. I think it's, it's very applicable to EVMS and, this, and NSU, ODU, and our hospital partners in the region. Excellent. Now, Dr. Argo, you were going to make a comment? Yes, I would just, so, again, going back again to what Dr. Zhao said a few minutes ago in terms of the School of Public Health. If we end up you know, creating the traditional School of Public Health, we, we really have missed a good opportunity here. Um, so there's, like he mentioned, there's a social aspect of health. So if we use the traditional system of public health, we will miss the big picture. But in order for us to really have a meaningful impact on our community, we have to think very broadly. Um, it's not just um, your, your public health or medicine. There's housing, there's um, access to, uh, to uh, food, there's um, safety and neighborhood safety. So there's a whole in, in, in a host of issues that we need to take into account if we really want to make a very unique uh, contribution here. Thank you. Yeah. In, in that regard, uh, Dr. Igo, I would definitely, because you're a university, I would definitely use the, con the concept of convergence uh, between the, the technology fields, engineering fields, and public health fields. There's a huge need for integrating that. And that could be uh, one of these signature building blocks, however you want to call them. But you, you self-define as a multi-transdisciplinary public health, school of public health. Those are not existing. They're not available today. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like you to get the state to pay for some of this, right? It's a, it's a novel program for the state. Uh, I'm I'm going to bring that up. I'm going to bring up what would happen if the state continues to uh, back down on their, their financial support for academic medical centers. But Dr. Fulton, you have a question? No, I was just going to say, um, I would add to that convergence model, Good. not for us to forget uh, the humanities areas and social sciences that uh, really bring uh, valuable expertise to the uh, human side, right, of health. And um, not just with uh, social science studies, but uh, as well with um, studying the human condition and how that um, informs our, the, the ways in which we address health and, uh, and educate our healthcare providers and, and the ways in which we uh, ourselves um, consider and explore uh, 
how humanity has um, has 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 uh, divided and understood the uh, broad diversity of um, human beings. And so all of these areas, these collaborative um, areas, I think really engage and speak to one another. Um, I, for example, I think our uh, Center for African American Public Policy that has been establishing excellence uh, grounded in our political science department's expertise and engagement and advocacy and um, building links between public health and public policy initiatives uh, promises to enhance health promotion, health education, again, especially among African Americans and other minority communities. Well, the question that Scott has asked, I would love to see this collaboration leverage to increase the pipeline of underrepresented careers in medicine. Would this also be a goal of our partnership? And the answer is yes, but I'm not going to talk with you all. Any comments on that? I think we said it um, uh, clearly. I mean, if, it, if there's not that component of human capital formation that is diverse and representative of the population we're trying to, to help, uh, it would fail. So I completely agree with Scott's statement. LD, I, I'd like to add something to this. Please, please do, Dr. Zell. Too many people talk about diversity without really understanding the root cause. So people look at diversity inclusion as a numbers game. Do we have enough percent African Americans? Do we have enough percent Asians? But I think what would be unique would be to address the structural racism and the root cause of issue. So such a school must get down to acknowledging these issues and address them. And so I would like to add that dimension to the kind of work that can be done here. Excellent. Excellent. Now, they, the, the Wilkins asked the question, how should we promote trust among the principal players? So they have already picked up there's a, there's a trust problem. How, how would we promote trust and assess uh, commitment to a common vision? So that, that this person is saying that they picked up that we don't have a trust amongst the components. I, I would say, look, I mean- That's, that's not my question. This is the question from the audience. Yeah, I would say there are two, two, two factors to this. First, how did you lose trust? And second, how do you rebuild trust? And I think the question here is, you know, uh, that if the trust has been lost, there must be reasons to that. The second is to rebuild trust is not something you can do over one meeting and a glass of wine. You really have to work at it. And the way I, I would say is that you have to create positive experimental uh, environment of trust. People will trust you if they can predict and experience a, uh, a, a trustworthy behavior on your part. And so that's what I always say. You know, the, the, the clinical definition of trust that I like best is when it, it, it says that trust is the ability to predict someone's behavior. When you uh -huh. lose trust, when you lose trust is because somebody has surprised you. Somebody has disappointed you. And the question is, how do you rebuild that? Well, you can only rebuild it by being predictable, by being transparent, but you cannot do it across the world front. You have to do it with what uh, uh, Victor was talking about, building blocks of trust. Just like you build programs, you have to have a tangible way of engaging and eventually delivering mutual trust. Anyone else wants to address that, Dr. Zhao? No, I already said it right. Okay, fair enough. So I, I, one of the things I want to say is that, um, you know, you have to commit to being equal partners. One of the areas, one of the things that uh, as Norfolk State, as we uh, entered into conversation about this project and collaborative is an insistence on uh, Norfolk State being an equal partner in this collaboration. And, and, and so that means at every level. And uh, I agree with Dr. Zoni uh, around um, multiple meetings, conversation, getting to know one another, um, and, and uh, making sure that as we, um, that, that this is a very inclusive process 
and um, that each of the, the partners are, um, as, as I said, equal uh, in every way um, in, in the developing the structure and developing um, governance. And that's one of the ways to uh, build equal partner, uh, e to build trust. And Dr. Fulton, you feel like you're an equal partner, don't you? I do. I do. <laughs> but, you know, but as I said, you know, it, it's about um, uh, building that um, from the beginning, right? And for uh, not one institution or partner being an afterthought or marginal in the process. Um, and so that's, uh, again, about uh, building the trust um, because um, this, this new initiative, you know, we are, we are uh, as I see it, coming to Norfolk State, uh, starting from scratch here on this initiative. And so um, if we are going forward uh, together, then that trust is built um, from the beginning. Well, can I say this? I think the one thing we have, you know, going in the photos now is that we do have some existing partnership. Uh, for example, there's a um, doctoral degree in clinical psychology. That's yeah. a joint um, EVMS, ODU, and Norfolk State mm -hmm. University program, and has been in place for several years. And um, biomedical sciences is on the area where we have faculty from EVMS um, mentoring ODU students and working, some of them actually working in our lab. So, so we have something that, that we already have in place that we can build upon. The, the School of Public Health, again, is one a major um, initiative in our region here that will really force us again to build on some of the, uh, the existing relationship that we have in place. So to me, I see that as a very encouraging sign that um, there's hope here that we'll be able to work as together moving forward. Now, this is appropriate because the last question I have before I turn it over to Dr. Holman, what role does the community have in creating the vision? We've been talking about community, but what active role? Help help me out. The community is saying, okay, fine. I'm all fired up. But what role, How? what, what do I do? What would be your response? Well, you absolutely have to engage the community because people support what they build. And you don't want to have a top-down approach. That being said, obviously, it starts off with you guys because you, you have the vision. <laughs> But before you go too far, we have to bring it out to the community through different mechanisms, whether through elected officials, uh, leading voices, but also town halls and others for people to understand what you're trying to build. So I think that you really can't build something, particularly in the area of public health, without the engagement of community. Right. Excellent. One approach that uh, we've been um, developing and, and considering and developing our public health collaborative here at Norfolk State uh, would be to form a community participatory research council with institutions and community leaders and representatives, again, as equal partners. Um, NSU faculty uh, would certainly bring their expertise, but this council could be guided by established initiatives, such as the program sponsored by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Dr. Argo, you wanna help me out with the, how can the community be more involved in crafting the uh, vision? Well, I think what Dr. Fortin just described is exactly how it should be done. And, and that's the approach that we're going to take. And I go back again to the um, statement I made a few minutes ago that we're not trying to do something to the community. We are going to be working with the community and the, we will be involved in the, the community as we define problems, we're coming up with solutions that will work and how we actually implement programs. The community has to be an equal partner in all of the phases of how we uh, move forward with some of our programming. Let, let me, let me. Oh, yeah, one, one little detail. My experience in in, uh, in that context really involves two things. First of all, I completely agree with all the statements about involving the community. But here I would also say you need to involve them, whether it be a health council, public health council, whatever. 
but you need to have a methodology. So it's it's both representation, uh, advice, and methodology. The me and I would refer to Dr. Fulton on this because I use I use the method called the Delphi method, and mm -hmm. and so that people come with a very understandable framework of contribution to the, to the debate and the process, not just like a feel good. Uh, let's listen to everybody, and then I summarize my own way about what I heard. So that that. The two components, participation and methodology, are very important to define the roadmap forward. Well, let me commend everyone. This has been a powerful panel. This has been broad-based. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my boss, uh, President Holman, for the final words. Thank you, Dr. Britt. And I want to, uh, too, thank our participants, Dr. Fulton, Dr. Ago, and our special guests, Dr. Zhao and Dr. Zerhoni. I think this has been very enlightening. I think it sets the stage for the trust. I, th I think I feel more trustful of our partners. I hope it's reciprocal. That's the first phase of developing relationships as we can move forward, as we listen to the community as well and what their needs are, and then engage our individuals that aren't here tonight, our clinical partners, in that process. Uh, but I think it's been extraordinarily enlightening, and I think it's provided us with a context, a contextual framework from both Dr. Zerhoni's perspective and Dr. Zhao, that allows us then to be able to have a pathway. And I know uh, Dr. Zerhoni knows what that means, um, uh, like you did at the NIH, where we have to have a path. And it can diverge, but you have to set forth together. And as, as the moment changes and as the priorities change, as the resources change, we have to be receptive. But we have to always have it with the context of the patient, the community, and the health of the region. What are we doing? We're, I always say, we're a school of medicine, okay? EBMS Medical School, the noun is school, and we need to train the next generation to know that their obligation is to be able to provide the health for those in most need, to improve the diversity within our, our system, to be able to provide uh, partnerships with NSU, uh, with ODU, with our high schools that we're doing for pipeline programs to provide aspirational opportunities to lift, lift the boats, lift, lift the community as we work together. So it's in that context that I just can't thank Dr. Zhao and Dr. Zahoni for participating tonight and our, our guests from ODU, Dr. Fulton, uh, and, and uh, from NSU and Dr. Ago from ODU, and certainly Dr. Britt, um, we're partners, I'm not your boss. Just wanna make sure you reframe that. We're all, partner, we're all partners today, as we are partners with our community and the patients we serve. Well, the next so, panel we have is gonna be how we have become a best practice. I look forward to that panel session. We'll do that. And this is the first, this is the first stage and the, and the, and the, of the communication. So I, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Britt, for your work and uh, all the participants and for our questionnaires and the audience that participated tonight. So um, the first brick on the yellow brick road is always the toughest, and I think we laid the first brick down. And we're gonna work together to try to develop that road. So many thanks to everyone, and thank you so much to the community for participating. Thank you all, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.